Yeah, good uh, afternoon, everybody. I would like to start my talk thanking the organizers for the invitation. And I apologize to the organizers not having answered all the emails. Um, but I'm here. And uh, also, I would like to say I really enjoy uh, these type of conferences because the, the audience is a finite number and uh, the community is diverse. So uh, I think we can learn a lot from each other. Um, we have here, uh, I think, um, keynote speakers, we have lecturers, and we have talks. And uh, this is a talk, and I thought maybe you benefit from my talk best if I shine some little lights on some base, uh, which are maybe not every day in the limelight uh, of uh, PILs, natures, and science, uh, but are still very interesting and uh, uh, worthwhile investigating. Um, so I decided to look at uh, three topics, the zero-point fluctuations of small atoms and clusters, uh, chiral magnetism in chains, and uh, uh, the life beyond the Heisenberg model for, uh, for uh, magnetic uh, thin films and uh, nanostructures. And let me say one thing, all my results are from ab initio, and I, in this talk I only work on metals. Um, uh, the, um, the, the work is, was done in collaboration with my student uh, Markus Hoffmann, uh, Benedikt Schweflinghaus, and the postdoc, my postdoc Bernd Zimmermann. And I'm collaborating with a group of Samia Lunis, and I collaborated here in particular with Julen Ibanez Aspiros from, uh, San, uh, from, from Basque Country and uh, Manuel dos Santos from uh, Portugal. Right, let me come to the first topic zero point spin fluctuation in single magnetic atoms and clusters. Well, um, the study of clusters uh, on surfaces and in the gas phase has quite some history. And what is very intriguing in the system is that the spin and orbital moment, the magnetic structure, the magnetic anisotropy, and probably also the condo behavior depends on the cluster shape, the cluster size, the substrate, and the substrate orientation. So there is plenty of things um, which varies. And uh, each cluster can have basically its own um, notion. And I would like to relate all this uh, to experimental things like uh, uh, iron, co uh, cobalt, and rhodium, and silver, and platinum, and so on. So in the 90s, uh, we did a lot of work uh, calculating magnetic moments in this system. Uh, and I would like to show you here uh, only silver 100. And I show you here niobium, molybdenum, technetium, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium. So these are the 40s and the 50s. They are either atoms and dimers and four atom chains and tri three atom chains and uh, um, nine atom clusters and four atom clusters. And all the magnetic moments are somehow different. But let's focus on molybdenum. For example, molybdenum has a magnetic moment uh, if you have a dimer and if you have a four atoms chain. But it has no magnetic moment if you have a three atom chain, nor it has a magnetic moment as an island. For, for example, um, uh, ruthenium, uh, is very stable if you have square structures and so on. So you have magnetic structures which have large magnetic moment. Uh, these are 4D systems and these are 5D systems. And of course, uh, one other aspect of the, uh, then the magnetic moment is the magnetic anisotropy. When here you see a calculation of the anisotropy of all the 3D elements, 4D elements and 5D elements and also elements which do not exist because I'm changing the nuclear number in small digits. And so, um, so what you see then basically uh, for the 3Ds, I have a large uh, um, orbital moment in the, between cobalt and nickel. Um, I have large orbital moments in the, in the uh, sorry, large um, and magnetic anisotropies in the region around uh, ruthenium and palladium. And um, I have a gigantic uh, uh, magnetic anisotropies around iridium. Here you see, for example, the scale here is uh, 28 milliEV units, when here you have 6.5. So it is a totally different unit, and you have gigantic uh, um, magnetic anisotropies if these magnetic structures are magnetic. Um, here is an example of the size of uh, at atoms of 40 metals on silver. You see large magnetic moments, uh, as large as for the 3Ds. You see the maximum is always uh, in the center of the transition metal series because this is Huhn's rule. Half filling gives you uh, basically maximum moment, interatomic exchange. And um, 
many of these results, or some of these results, are really confirmed experimentally using weak localization, XMZD, SDM. Uh, you see, saw this morning uh, a result of Harald Brune, um, for example, the magnetic anisotropy of uh, cobalt clusters of different sizes uh, on uh, the platinum surface, and also the uh, related orbital moment uh, to these clusters. This is one confirmation of uh, such uh, theoretical results. Of course, I have here another biased selection um, of results, for example, cobalt uh, particles, iron atoms, um, and I don't know what is studied here, probably also iron and cobalt. So basically, there is experimental confirmation on this side. Now, if you look at these four Ds and uh, realize this work was done in 1994, so the experimentalists had some time to look at this. Um, uh, so if you, look, if, you, if you make an honest analysis of the literature, um, I would say there are not many. And um, so I, I do not know exactly how I uh, should uh, phrase this Honolka, paper of Honolka. I, will, I interp interpret, he looked very hard and found very little. And this is probably also true for uh, Schaefer and Bergman uh, using weak localization. So uh, I, would, uh, I would state that on the 3D sides, I believe my calculations. On the 4D sides, I have some doubts. Um, this brings me back to the theory and says, oh, let's look again about, uh, at this. And I remind you at the Stoner criterion, which is related basically to the second derivative of the energy as function of the magnetization or the magnetic moment, this gives you related to the susceptibility. And if the susceptibility in the paramagnetic state is negative, then of course you can gain energy uh, by forming a magnetic moment. And this leads finally to the Stoner uh, criterion. So and here I did a calculation where I calculated for niobium, a 4D metal, uh, for the atom, basically, um, the uh, energy as function of the length of the ma magnetic moment. And you see, indeed, uh, you gain energy if you form a magnetic moment. And this magnetic moment has a, uh, the minimum of the energy is around 3 eV. And then if you make a fit of this energy functional, the, 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 sec the curvature, you can relate to the exchange integral. And by this, you can calculate, basically, uh, exchange times uh, uh, density of states at a Fermi energy, uh, which has to be larger than one to fulfill the Stoner criterion. And you see, they are all larger than one, but significantly larger for iron, manganese, and cobalt, and slightly larger for the 4Ds. So this brings you now back to another issue. Uh, so you make it, but you barely make it. Uh, if you look at this uh, energy curve, maybe it reminds you a little bit like a harmonic oscillator. And in the harmonic oscillator, you have of zero point motion. You have a, a zero point frequency. Of course, you have also zero point frequency in the magnetic system, um, and that is what I'm looking at. What is the role of the zero point, uh, mag uh, uh, zero point um, magnetization, the zero point uh, spin fluctuation onto the magnetization? This is a very important issue, particularly for, uh, um, yeah, for, for certain spin systems like manganese silicide but was uh, never investigated here for, uh, for thin film systems, atoms, and clusters. So basically what it leads to, it can be that you have spin fluctuations, zero point motion, zero point spin fluctuations, which finally uh, lead to a phase transition. And this would be in the regime of this quantum critical uh, point. Um, so what I need is somehow an access to fluctuations. And uh, I recall this uh, flu I recall the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which basically gives me an idea how to relate the magnetic fluctuations to the uh, dissipation, which I uh, study by response property. And the, the response property uh, at hand here is the magnetic susceptibility. So I have a variance of the magnetic moment uh, with respect uh, um, related to the imaginary part of the susceptibility. And I'm focusing here not on longitudinal fluctuations, which I would do for manganese silicide. Here I'm f f uh, um, focusing on transversal fluctuations, and you will see, uh, will see soon why. And uh, I get access to this uh, susceptibility on the basis of time-dependent density function theory. I solve the time-dependent density function th theory in linear response in the frequency domain, and basically can uh, receive then 
um, the susceptibility of the interacting system is related to the susceptibility of the cone sham, sam, cone sham system divided by a denominator, and uh, I wrote u for u in the denominator because this is a, a parameter you know best, but in reality it's the exchange kernel. Um, and now what I'm going to do is uh, basically calculate this property with the kohn korinka kohn rostrocker method and calculate exactly this frequency-dependent susceptibility. And this, uh, the calculation of this frequency-dependent susceptibility was built up by Samir Lunis as he was uh, Alexander von Humboldt a fellow with uh, Doug Mills in uh, Irvine. So what you uh, ex get from such a result, uh, from such a calculation, is this imaginary part of the susceptibility. And if you don't have any spin-orbit interaction, your result is totally simple because you know you can rotate your atom as you want. You need, and you need zero frequency for that. And therefore, uh, uh, you have a delta function at a frequency equal to zero. Uh, and that's it. So this is this red thing. But if you have spin-orbit interaction, of course, you know that you uh, introduce a gap at uh, q equals zero, so to speak, uh, an excitation gap. And the, exactly this excitation gap defines the, uh, the, the, the resonance frequency, which is given here. And then you have another parameter, which is very important, which is the width. And the width is related to the uh, electron hole excitation so to say, uh, the stoner excitation around electron hole around the Fermi energy. So this determines basically the width. <coughs> and here I show you the results for the 40 atoms on silver. Um, so you see, for example, molybdenum has a small spin, obviously a small spin orbit interaction, has a strong peak closer to zero. Whereas, for example, here ruthenium has an extremely broad peak. And you can uh, now relate, yeah, as I told you, the, the width is determined by uh, excitations uh, around the Fermi energy, spin excitations. And so a measure of the spin excitation is the density of states of spin up times the density of states of spin down. And then you see, for example, for molybdenum, uh, de both densities of states are small at the Fermi energy, so the width is small. Uh, whereas, for example, for ruthenium, you're sitting in the middle of a very broad peak and you see the, the width is very broad. And now if you integrate this uh, 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 susceptibility over the, over the frequency, uh, you see that over, if you have integrated over the peak, you are basically in saturation. And uh, this goes, of course, fast for molybdenum and takes some uh, frequencies, uh, some milliEV uh, for ruthenium. But the most shocking result of this transparency is, is that the mean square uh, of the fluctuation is totally gigantic. It is itself, uh, the root of the mean square is itself 2 to 3 Bohr magneton. That means, in other words, uh, it's of the same order of magnitude as your magnetic moment itself. Um, so uh, this is a very general feature that the transverse spin fluctuation is of the order of the Bohr magneton. Uh, here I show you the 3D results, these are the 4D results. You basically see the spin orbit interaction is much smaller. Um, basically, you are, the curves are closer to a frequency equal zero, but also here you get rather large spin transversal spin fluctuations. So here I show uh, you the magnetic moment. Uh, here I show you the uh, square root of the fluctuations. You see uh, basically the, uh, the, the, the size of the fluctuations scales with the magnetic moment. It is uh, the ratio of spin fluctuation to magnetic moment is smaller um, for 3Ds than for 4Ds. So now I would like to make a, a small model to understand this better. The way I do my model is I just solve the landau lichfeld gilbert equation, uh, but in the, in the linear response regime, and from this linear response regime, I can calculate the transverse susceptibility. Um, and the transverse susceptibility has this particular form. And all these parameters, like the width of the peak, the magnetic moment, are known th through my ab initio calculations. I can fit this and can basically uh, integrate this um, susceptibility and get an analytical expression uh, for the uh, fluctuations. Sorry, but does this enter into the uh, 
So you to, to apply a small frequency dependent B field, you look at the response and uh, you do a Fourier transform, a time dependent Fourier transform, and look at the response and then you get the susceptibility. Ah, okay. So, uh, sorry. Um, it does not end that I, I derive it from that. Um, so, but then I can integrate it basically, and uh, so what you see is the following. I have, uh, I, I, if you look, uh, there's a square of the fluctuation scales like the magnetic moment. So what, I'm, what the color scale is basically the measure of uh, fluctuations versus magnetic, uh, magnetic moment. So that means um, if uh, you are here in blue, the fluctuations are small compared to red. And what you see is basically the most important factor determining the fluctuation is this eta, which is the damping parameter, which is the width of the peak, which is the uh, electron hole excitations. Not very important is the size of the frequency, because you see uh, here, these uh, elements have very different frequencies, but have basically the same eta, and this is basically then determining uh, the color code, and the color code means you have the same uh, ratio of uh, variance to magnetic moment. Um, so now we know we have large fluctuations uh, and now I'm asking myself what is the influence of these fluctuations to the magnetic magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy. So the magnetic uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy has been discussed already many times in during these talks. So it's basically a, a parameter proportional to cosine square or sine square depending on your definition. And basically, uh, this parameter K gives you the energy difference between, for example, the state um, uh, perpendicular to the surface or anti-perpendicular to a surface. Um, or uh, basically, you can also say out of plane and in plane, depending. Uh, so now, the next thing is, uh, you can rewrite this expression a little bit and scale it uh, by the size, uh, by the square of the magnetic moment and uh, uh, the vector component, and if you now include the fluctuations uh, in your system, you do get your change in the spirit of uh, the spin fluctuation theory of Moria, that uh, you change the magnetic moment uh, m squared by the magnetic moment plus the transversal fluctuations, you see that you actually rescale uh, your um, um, magnetocrystalline anisotropy constant. And the rescaling depends on these uh, fluctuations. And here I show you a, a picture. So we uh, have minimum here and minimum here, the barrier which we discussed. And the barrier is reduced due to the fluctuations. And now I have shown you, uh, show you here uh, now final results for chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, or niobium, niptium, technetium, ruthenium uh, on silver. And you see here the magnetocrystalline anisotropy constants. For example, iron is large. Ruthenium is large, but if you take the renormalization, which I have discussed, you see the values are significantly smaller. And for example, here in ruthenium, you reduced your magnetocrystalline anisotropy by an order of magnitude. This morning in the talk of uh, Wiesendanger, we have heard that uh, he found for iron and cobalt an uh, experimental value uh, for iron and copper, 111, sorry, an experimental value of minus 1 milliEV. So uh, the unrenormalized unreno uh, magnetic anisotropy is 4.73 milliEV. Uh, the renormalized one is 0.3. Um, we are still, I would say, the question is how accurate you want to be, but I think the direction uh, is clear. Um, so overall, uh, the overall effect is that the magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy is strongly reduced due to transversal spin fluctuations, zero-point spin fluctuations. Uh, so, to concluding this part of my talk, um, basically I think these are the first uh, zero-point spin fluctuation uh, results for uh, atoms. Uh, we want to continue this now for clusters and frustrated nanostructures. Uh, basically, the uh, fluctuations are in the order of uh, the size of the magnetic moment. Um, the, these fluctuations are really important. And they are basically controlled by the damping um, and the damping is basically controlled by the uh, um, stoner type excitations around the Fermi energy. Let me come to my second part of my talk, uh, but I realize the, 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 the time is running, so I skip this part and come now to the third uh, part of my talk, uh, which is uh, the life beyond the Heisenberg model. 
I think uh, during this uh, lecture series of lectures, we realized we are all very, very happy if you can write uh, down a spin Hamiltonian. And uh, we, I think we concluded on uh, various parts of the spin Hamiltonian, which is the Heisenberg exchange, which is the magnetocrystalline anisotropy. And I think this morning, uh, Professor Wiesendanger introduced the jaloszynski moria exchange. And uh, the dipole-dipole interaction is sometimes also important, but uh, not necessarily all the time, because if you have only one atom, it's certainly not so important. But uh, if you have two atoms, it's also not important. But if you have maybe uh, one million, it becomes important. Um, and this is totally sufficient to describe very complicated magnetic structures such as a left winding antiferromagnetic uh, spin spiral on, um, uh, of manganese on tungsten. But sometimes we are less lucky. I show you two, two examples here. These are two monolayers manganese on tungsten or ion and iridium. These, uh, this particular magnetic structure uh, shows also a, a spiral, but this spiral has a cone. So this spiral is not a simple flat spiral, this spiral has a cone. And this particular uh, nanoskirmion lattice uh, has a very, very interesting magnetic structure, but you will not be able to explain it by uh, the Heisenberg, by the Hamiltonian, which I've showed before. None of those can be explained by this Hamiltonian before. What you need are additional terms. Now these are terms, uh, we call them, for example, here the four spin interaction and here the biquadratic interaction. They are necessary. Now the question is a little bit, um, do these interactions come fall out of sky or how do we come to this interaction? So far I could explain everything with these additional terms and my life was happy. But recently I became unhappy because we investigated another structure um, and this is ein, iron on rhodium 111. But before I do this calculation let me remind you what, how we we want the f basically, the first thing what you want to know is the ground state, of, uh, the magnetic ground state of a system. And um, the magnetic ground state, um, if it's not ferromagnetic magnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, uh, you have to find it. And that is not as easy as you may think. Um, and one clever way of doing this is knowing if the Heisenberg interaction is the most important one, and you have the Heisenberg uh, Hamiltonian, and you say this Heisenberg is a classical Heisenberg model, and uh, this Heisenberg model is on a lattice, then you know, uh, on a periodic lattice, then you know the exact solution of this uh, Heisenberg model is a spin spiral. So here you have a spin spiral, and typically, due to symmetry arguments, you know that most likely the ground state is along the high symmetry lines of the Brion zone of all possible spin spirals. For example, if you do now an ab initio calculation of a spin spiral along this line here, most likely you catch the minimum. And this is what we have done here. So this is the gamma point, the K point, the M point, the gamma point. And then you can follow the energy along these high symmetry lines and you see the maximum is here. Uh, this is the most in non-interesting point for you. But the minimum is here. And this uh, means that you have an incommensurate spin spiral. Uh, because you have an arbitrary Q vector somewhere. Um, yeah. And these magnetic structures here uh, on high symmetry points, they might be familiar with you to you because this is the ferromagnetic state, this is the uh, rho vice anti-ferromagnetic state, this is the 120 degree Niel state, and so on. But this one, this is an incommensurate spin spiral. Now, maybe you are happy and stop. And, uh, but sometimes you are also very critical because um, if you can uh, form um, a magnetic state of a single, uh, of a, if, you, if you have a magnetic state which is a uh, spin spiral, for example, uh, this M point, then you have another M point which is this one. Of course, due to symmetry, it must have the same energy. But if you have a missing higher interaction, then you get mode-mode coupling on this, the, the, the sign of this higher interaction determines now whether the superposition of this mode has higher energy or lower energy. Or it has the same energy, then this term is zero. So therefore we look also uh, at structures which are actually superpositions of uh, single Q states and we call them double Q states and triple Q states and so on. Um, and here you see, for example, the energy 
of a, a double Q state we call this the up up down down state this is another up up down down state uh, which is basically perpendicular to this one and you see uh, they have different energies and the killer is that this energy here is lower than anything else far lower than anything else so now I'm asking myself is this now uh, first of all the first question is is density function theory as a method wrong to, the, uh, to, the, to get this point right. So for this, we need experiments. I always talk to Matthias Bode to make this experiment for me. This is iron on rhodium 111. He always promised me on the phone, but when I phone him again, he has forgotten about it. So I, I will work on him. Uh, but what you're sp and the basic problem on, on, this, uh, on this sheet is you have now three of these uh, multi Q states and you cannot describe the energy of these multi Q states by the biquadratic term and four spin interaction which I have shown you before. So if I do that, I, if I include now this uh, four spin interaction and the biquadratic interaction, the problem is that this peak here, uh, this uh, point, uh, this arrow, double arrow here, must have the same length as this one. That is the problem. So I'm missing an interaction it becomes a little bit unwieldy and uh, so uh, you open textbooks for interactions and uh, you're running out of them slowly and uh, so uh, basically uh, we have to realize um, so I came to the conclusion one has to put it on a solid ground so I would like to remind you at one thing uh, which you all know so if you uh, this is the Heisen so S1 S2 is Heisenberg but imagine it's a quantum Heisenberg then you have basically uh, Pauli matrices here. And uh, I wrote here Sx. And if you take the square of this product of two Pauli matrices, the algebra is such that the square will lead to this um, single Heisenberg term again. That means for a spin one half system, you really be lucky because it's really Heisenberg. There is nothing else. But if you have a spin one system, like shown here, uh, this is the matrix for the spin one system, when you take it, for example, for to the power three, then you have a term, the biquadratic term, and you have the, the Heisenberg term. And you can continue with this uh, analysis. So basically, if you have a system of uh, spin uh, S, for example, S equal to two, we discussed this morning, then you can go up to power four. And now the question is, what is your prefactor here? Since each power gives you one order of perturbation theory, you hope typically it goes down. So you have nothing here. But in metal metallic systems, this can be different. So basically what we did is, uh, so we wrote down a, a multi-band Hubbard model. And now, uh, this is a gigantic Hamiltonian, it has a gigantic Hilbert space, of course. And we are, but we are only interested in a very, very small sector in which we look at spin excitation. All the fermionic degrees of freedom, uh, of dynamic degrees of freedom, has been projected out by a Löwdin transformation. And then what you get is the following. If your system is spin 1, and I must say the following, in metallic systems at metal surfaces, you typically have not a spin one half system. You have typically spin one, spin three half, spin two. So it is uh, not uncommon to have spin one. So if you look at spin one and two sides, then you see immediately uh, that uh, in second order perturbation theory, you get your Heisenberg. In fourth order perturbation, you get also a Heisenberg, but you get additional term, or this is this biquadratic term. If you go over now to three sides, you have now uh, the second order Heisenberg, the fourth order Heisenberg, the biquadratic term which I have shown you here, and a particular term which we call the free spin interaction. And if you go to four sides, we have then a four spin interaction, this which I have shown you before. And if I go, for example, to the S equal three half on two sides, then, for example, you could in six order, if you want to do that, uh, you get a, a bicubic term. So basically what I'm saying is uh, what, we, what I derived is basically more out of a 
of a Hubbard model, I derived a spin model. On this spin model, I use now to fit my ab initio calculations. And if I do that, so I had, what was missing is this particular term here. And now, if I get uh, everything together, I uh, can explain this difference here, the difference there, by this uh, four spin, uh, that is three spin interaction, which is missing. And uh, yeah, there's one, one thing which makes me unhappy. The, four, the three spin interaction is very, very large. So the value is four milliEV. And I haven't figured out why this value is so large. So this is the biquadratic term, this is the uh, Heisenberg uh, term, magnetic anisotropy is very small in the system. Uh, uh, sorry, the four spin interaction is very small in the system, but the three spin interaction is very large. And this I have not understood. So basically, um, what I try to show you is that uh, in metallic systems, especially at surfaces where the magnetic moments are, an interface where the magnetic moments are very large, then you have additional uh, terms beyond the Heisenberg model which go, when we investigated those up to fourth order, um, uh, we have a four spin interaction of different types, uh, which we didn't include before. And uh, we have the occurrence of a biquadratic interaction. And we have uh, an additional interaction, which is the three spin interaction. Um, so these, the interplay of all these interactions can lead to very, very complicated uh, spin structures. And this morning, uh, you have probably heard the word skirmion in, uh, in the talk of Professor Wiesendanger. There are other topological structures which can be uh, stabilized by higher powers of interactions. And for example, Hopfion. And therefore, it is uh, interesting to have higher spin interactions because they may lead uh, to uh, new topological structures. Um, so what we need is an experiment uh, to show whether our basic uh, theory is correct, that we really found the right ground state before we make all these acrobatics with the three-spin interaction. What makes me so far unhappy is that the three-spin interaction is large and I could not explain the size. Um, so now I think I stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>